Welcome to the Fatty Acid Forum, sponsored by Virtus Nutrition. Join Dr. Barry Bradford from Kansas State University as he takes a look at how nutrition influences the immune system of a dairy cow. Now, here's Dr. Bradford. In this presentation, I want to start the discussion about how nutrition can influence the immune system. As you might expect, this is a very large topic. There's no way I can completely cover it, but I want to introduce the concept and talk about some examples of nutrients that have very clear effects on immunity. Now, first of all, I want to think broadly about how nutrition can influence health uh, because it's not necessarily just through altering the immune system directly. So uh, different nutrients or different diets can certainly influence health through influencing the health of the gut, especially in room nutrition. We're very familiar with that concept. Metabolic health, and we think about that a lot in early lactation dairy cows, but then also through direct effects on immune function. And the point of this graphic is to show that all three of these factors interact. So we could potentially cause problems, for example, with immune function by simply not adequately supporting gut health and uh, vice versa. So what nutrients can influence the immune system? Well, pretty much all of them. So I could go through examples from every nutrient class that's been characterized and I uh, don't want to spend that sort of time. But suffice it to say that just as every other system in the body requires a variety of nutrients to support normal function, so does the immune system. Uh, in addition, successful immunity requires a good barrier function throughout the body. Uh, requires support from the metabolic system, etc. And so many, many nutrients can come into play. And one of the things that makes this really tricky is by assessing growth or reproduction or milk production, we may come up with required nutrient levels to support normal function. But those requirements that we've established may not always be sufficient to maximize immune function. So as we know, the, the status of the animal influences its requirements for nutrients, and simply having to fight off an infection can dramatically alter the requirements for some of those nutrients. So the problem is, unless we purposefully make animals sick and assess their responses to different nutrients, it's hard for us to come up with numbers for requirements that would support maximal or appropriate immune function. So these numbers can be very difficult to come up with. And just as an example of a requirement that's likely differs by the status of the animal, the health status, here's some data from a study from Brad Johnson's group. And so this is in high-risk feedlot cattle just coming into the lot, and they gave these animals an LPS challenge. So lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin uh, is a highly inflammatory molecule causes animals to eat less feed typically and causes a number of other dysfunctions. Well, in this case, when supplemental chromium was fed, the decline in average daily gain was much less for animals fed the chromium product compared to controls, despite the fact that they didn't eat anymore. Okay, so this suggests somehow these animals were more metabolically efficient or perhaps less fuel was wasted, maybe in an inflammatory response or some other response associated with the endotoxin. So again, just a very simple example of how there was no observed response to chromium in the rest of the study, but during an LPS challenge, clearly that chromium, that extra chromium had some influence on the animal. So again, very hard to say what's the requirement for the animal that may undergo a challenge like this at some point. Okay, so do we have a similar example in the dairy industry? Absolutely. Okay, so as most people watching this would know, Cows in early lactation have much, much higher total disease incidence than any other group of mature animals on a dairy farm. Okay, in many farms, these cows in the first two or three weeks of lactation would account for 50 to 75 percent of the total disease issues on the farm. So, in, ideally, uh, we could design a nutritional program that would help us to push down the incidence of diseases during this time, and if we can get through that risk period with less problems, then it should have a major impact on the total health of the herd as a whole. So uh, just as an example then of a type of nutrient that might impact the immune system, perhaps indirectly, I want to talk a little bit about yeast cells. These always attract a lot of attention in dairy nutrition. Uh, yeast products have been marketed for many years with lots of different opinions on their efficacy and mode of action. 
but I think there's been some really interesting studies in the last several years, and these are not necessarily in ruminants, but in this case, some pre-ruminant calves were fed calf starter with either no additives or with hydrolyzed yeast added. And uh, after three weeks on the treatments, the, the calves were challenged with these live vaccines to, to give them uh, an immune challenge. As you can see here, this health score with a lower number being better demonstrates that the animals that received that hydrolyzed yeast had an overall better score from uh, blind observers. And in addition, if you look at antibody production against those organisms that were vaccinated, the animals getting the hydrolyzed yeast actually did have a higher antibody, uh, specific antibody production. So how are these uh, effects mediated? We don't exactly know, but I think there is some evidence that perhaps it's mediated through sensing in the gut. And so here's some examples of some responses that have been observed through in vitro studies. In this study, Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, was, or yeast, of course, was uh, incubated with uh, intestinal, swine intestinal epithelial cells. Um, and in the second picture, they also introduced uh, enterotoxin-containing E. coli, which without any other treatment would kill these epithelial cells. Okay, and so they were looking at what would happen to the actual intestinal cells that were cultured with these two organisms. And what they found is basically through a number of markers of inflammatory response, as expected, the E. coli caused a dramatic increase in immune mediators. This is uh, a chemotractant protein that's expressed, again, during an inflammatory state. And the co-introduction of the yeast, or the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, dramatically decreased that inflammatory response. And they also showed some evidence that perhaps this was due to the yeast actually binding to and essentially blocking E. coli from adhering to and affecting the intestinal epithelial cells. So some really interesting stuff coming out that I think kind of links the gut health and immune function aspects in terms of yeast uh, mode of action. Unfortunately, a lot of times we don't really know what impact going through the rumen would have on some of these modes of action. Okay, well, what about post-absorptive effects? What about nutrients that have entered the body and can affect immune cells directly? Uh, there's data in dairy cattle on all of these nutrients shown here, and you can find lots of literature on most of them. I want to focus right now briefly on specific groups of fatty acids. So one thing to keep in mind is that ruminal biohydrogenation makes it hard to deliver bioactive, unsaturated fatty acids to the cow. And there's a couple of approaches. One is to use calcium salts to slow the rate of biohydrogenation and allow more of those fatty acids to bypass the rumen. And so given that we have that ability now, should, what, what do omega-6 fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids do to the immune system? So why do we talk about those two classes specifically? Well, as mentioned, these are bioactive fatty acids. In other words, they have effects beyond simply providing a nutrient source for the body. And omega-6 fatty acids have long been known to promote inflammatory responses, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because they can uh, provide the substrate needed to produce important inflammatory signals that the immune system needs to trigger responses to infection. On the other hand, omega-3 fatty acids uh, are known as anti-inflammatory mediators, and they, again, partly work by being substrates for anti-inflammatory signals such as resolvins and uh, lipoxins and other uh, signals that the immune system uses to calm back down after an inflammatory response. One thing I want to point out real briefly is that although we think about these fatty acids as substrates for these eicosanoids, uh, omega-3s have been shown in mice anyway to actually work largely through a membrane receptor so that they're actually working as a, a ligand for a, sensing, a receptor that's sensing them. And to demonstrate this, uh, this group in 2010 showed that Animals receiving DHA, the omega-3 fatty acid in the diet, uh, normal animals as expected showed a pretty dramatic decrease in TNF-alpha concentrations. But 
when this G protein coupled receptor called GPR120 was knocked out, there was no response uh, to DHA. And they showed a number of other measures that likewise demonstrated that the impact of the omega-3 fatty acids was greatly reduced without that receptor. So regardless of the mode of action, what impact do these polyunsaturated fatty acids have on bovine immune cells? Well, some nice data has come out in the last few years, uh, largely from the Florida group, showing that at using palm oil as sort of a control in two different uh, groups of animals, they showed that immune cells, whether or not they were stimulated by an inflammatory signal, had greater expression of inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha uh, when they were exposed to an omega-6 fatty acid. And conversely, um, when they were exposed to omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil, the responsiveness to endotoxin went to essentially zero. Okay, so greatly dampened the inflammatory response. So this is exactly what we would expect from the mouse literature and suggests that cows can respond to these bioactive fatty acids as long as we can deliver them. So what's the right goal? That's a harder question. So sources of omega-3 fatty acids can, in, in cattle, can tone down the inflammatory state. My group and others have shown that excessive inflammation is associated with lower productivity, perhaps some metabolic problems, and so maybe you could argue that's a beneficial thing. On the other hand, sources of omega-6 fatty acids appear to enhance immune response, although this hasn't been tested in a true disease challenge at this point. Um, they have shown greater neutrophil responses, increases in acute phase proteins. So the question is, is the goal on a specific dairy to tone down inflammation that's perhaps running out of control, or is it to enhance immune status if there's lots of infectious disease problems? So in my opinion, we certainly need to continue working on answering some questions, but if someone were to ask me for a dairy producer today, I would say, well, what are the problems on this dairy? And then go from there. So, okay, to wrap this one up, basically nutrients have lots of impacts on immunity, and I think it's easy to overlook some of these, but certainly they work as substrates for cellular function. For example, uh, glucose is an important nutrient just to be broken down and used as a fuel to generate the ammunition that immune cells need to kill bacteria through the oxidative burst, okay, so they, they serve as that, but they also serve as signaling molecules, and we highlighted the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids as an example of that. We tend to talk about uh, deficiencies, and certainly that has to be considered. Uh, deficiencies of selenium, for example, have very uh, demonstrable negative impacts on the immune system, but I think it's also important to remember something that is sometimes forgotten, and that's that the animal's response to an infection sometimes purposefully leads to a quote-unquote deficiency. For example, one of the most obvious impacts of an acute phase response is a low availability of iron in the bloodstream. And when people first discovered this, some people did some studies where they then infused more iron, and lo and behold, the death rate of the animals increased dramatically. Well, the reason is during sepsis, when bacteria actually access the bloodstream, lack of iron is one of the main impediments to their growth. And so the liver is actually producing iron binding proteins to sequester the iron and keep it away from bacteria. So we have to keep these things in mind when we talk about nutritional support uh, during disease.